on the Jolly Jim Show. Those are the outsiders, and that's called Girl in Love. Fifteen minutes exactly before eight o'clock, and fifty more minutes to go here on Swing and Sixties for a Thursday. You know your own identity, sure you do. But will others know when it may be necessary to assist you in an emergency? Wear your ID, ID tags at all times. General Westmoreland perhaps feels tested. After establishing American forces in Vietnam, he is ready for the next step, an offensive against the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. The strongest area to attack is War Zone C, known as the Iron Triangle, for its three boundaries. This 155 square kilometer area is between the Saigon River, Tan Dien Forest, and Song Thi Tien River. South Vietnamese forces refuse to enter this dagger pointed to the heart of Saigon, just 20 miles from the capital city. Operation Cedar Falls will be the largest ground operation of the war, a search and destroy mission formulated to decimate enemy presence in the area and done with no warning to the citizens of Vietnam. Under his command are an approximate total of 30,000 U.S. and South Vietnamese troops, with the South Vietnamese focused on the civilian population and villages while the U.S. engages the enemy. The greatest challenge that Westmoreland and his forces face is in the guile of the Viet Cong. They have enmeshed themselves in villages creating their tunnel system and using the terrain to their advantage. The use of defoliants and 60 bulldozers will make short work of the concealing vegetation to hopefully eliminate that strategic advantage. U.S. units will line the Iron Triangle along two sides under the guise of routine deployment and then converge in a hammer and anvil tactic scouring for the enemy and their bases. The Viet Cong headquarters is located within the Iron Triangle in the village of Ben Suk. In 1964, the Viet Cong drove the South Vietnamese army out of the village, executed its leaders, and took Ben Suk over. They didn't just conquer it, but made Ben Suk an active part of their operations. Westmoreland plans to change that. They assume strategic positions on January 5, 1967. Ben Suk is a village of about 3,500. It lacks electricity, and its population lives simply. Uh, they would come in. Uh, they had very, they had little medical care. So sometimes people were the only, only time they ever saw a doctor or a nurse. And we would give, and most of the time it was to clean wounds, uh, cuts, uh, give out antibiotics, that type of thing, basic medical care. And they seemed to be pretty grateful for that. Civilian population, I kind of felt sorry for them. Um, when I wasn't doing anything on the guns, I was in charge of the ammo section and trash. I make the trash rounds down to the dump. And just looking at some of the people, how they, oh, they gorged themselves on our food that we threw away. They dug into the dumps, they got the clothes that we threw out, and like I said, the food we threw out, they were deprived. And they didn't have any of this stuff. It was all new. In fact, the funniest thing, we were up in Quantree, up north, and we gave them soap. And then all of a sudden that soap come flying back at you with teeth marks in it. They couldn't eat it. They didn't know what soap was. That was one of the funniest things I ever saw over there. Vietnam is very beautiful. And um, if you put aside the smells, there are temples, uh, beautiful flowers, uh, jungle. It was a lovely country, mountains. It looks like Hawaii in many respects. It was just it's a beautiful country and you look out South China Sea, blue, um, is a paradise in a lot of respects. By the end of Operation Cedar Falls, the villagers of Ben Suk 
will be forced to lead entirely different lives. One of the programs that the South Vietnamese and the United States Navy was working with is to train their cadets, their officers, be the equivalent of people going to Annapolis here. They put on board our vessels, and even though they were cadets and not commissioned officers yet, they'd have to work with the enlisted men to learn different things. So we had experience with them. One of the biggest problems we had is probably communications with the language. Um, you may have uh, four or five of these Vietnamese officers or cadets assigned to you, and only one could speak English. The action starts at 0800 hours, three days later, with an air assault on Ben Suk. U.S. forces surround the village with minimal resistance, letting a South Vietnamese battalion search the village. They uncover a tunnel system and many supplies. The Viet Cong agents found are only low ranking. The entire village is migrated to the now overcrowded village of Phu Loi. The longest and greatest system of tunnels is only 20 miles from Saigon in the Ku Chi district, a full length of 20 miles. The will of the American people is no longer being tested, but now challenged as protests intensify and the younger, hippie generation opts to preach love and peace rather than simply protest war. On January 14, 1967, at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, California, the Human Bee Inn is a gathering of the hippie counterculture who reject so-called middle-class morality and war for a radical liberal approach. Hippies focus on the concept of free love, drug use, communal living, a sense of ecology, and a total rejection of war. It brings around 30,000 and cements the hippie movement in the public consciousness. That summer, near 100,000 young people descend upon San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury neighborhood and turn the area into a virtual hippie commune. The hippie counterculture is in full swing. September 29th, 1967. This evening, I came here to speak to you about Vietnam. I do not have to tell you that our people are profoundly concerned about that struggle. There are passionate convictions about the wisest course for our nation to follow. There are many sincere and patriotic Americans who harbor doubts about sustaining the commitment that three presidents and a half a million of our young men have made. Doubt and debate are enlarged because the problems of Vietnam are quite complex. They are a mixture of political turmoil, of poverty, of religious and factional strife, of ancient servitude, and modern longing for freedom. Vietnam is all of these things. Amidst this social change, the public's perception of Vietnam starts to slip with the questioning of the war's purpose by the younger generation, as well as the media's portrayal of the war weakening the government's justification for the conflict. President Johnson must consider all of this while making inevitably unfavorable decisions. November 9th, 1967. Captain Lance P. C. John's McDonnell Douglas F-4C Phantom Jet is crippled when his dropped payload detonates mere feet from the underside of his plane he ejects. On his way down, he crashes into the trees near Vinh, North Vietnam. Si John awakens in pain. His right hand is crushed. His skull is fractured, and his left leg is broken. After he is downed, American forces launch a search and rescue mission. So a patrol goes out, engages the VC, Somebody gets wounded. The radio man calls in a chopper, medevac. 
okay? The medevac chopper comes in, dusts what we call dust off, dusts them off the battlefield, and takes them to the nearest facility. If it's a, it could be in a vac hospital, mass unit, or a clearing company. Their dust off was a, a medical evacuation helicopter unit, and uh, there were there were basically two different uh, nomenclatures. The first uh, cavalry division used medevac, and the difference would have been that medevac uh, the aircraft were armed uh, with offensive weapons, i.e., M60 uh, light machine guns mounted on board where with dust off, we went in unarmed according to the Geneva Convention. We would uh, uh, fly in unarmed and either if we could land, we would land and pick up the wounded uh, regardless of whether the firefight was still going on or not. And if we couldn't land, we would either use a jungle penetrator, which was kind of like a three-pronged uh, fish hook that we would lower down into the jungle, or if the wounded uh, had a, a severe back or head injury, we would use a Stokes litter, which was the very same type of litter that they used during the Second World War and Korean War. It was basically a wire basket, and uh, we'd, we'd lower that down, and uh, while we were hovering as low as we could into the jungle, people on the ground would go and lo load the wounded into the Stokes litter. Once the patient was loaded onto that, we would uh, uh, hoist them up, and uh, uh, depending upon how heavy the fire was, We'd either stay at a hover while we were uh, hoisting them up, or we would go and uh, uh, start to take off uh, while the crew chief would be uh, hoisting them up. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.